Hi guys and welcome back to my channel. The case that I'm going to be looking into today is a pretty widely known one. It is that of Peter Connolly or as he is more widely known, Baby P or Baby Peter as some of you may know him instead. He was a 17 month old little boy that was pretty much abused to death. As I said, it's widely known in a lot of areas. So for those of you who haven't heard of it, maybe, you know, maybe not everybody's heard of it out there. If you haven't, let me know because I'd be interested to know whether this is the first video I've seen on it. But I just have to warn you that it's a pretty upsetting case. It really, really is. And I want to just warn you, it features child abuse and child death. So if you're sensitive to that, if you're sensitive to, you know, children cases, then maybe don't watch this one because it is awful. I would advise you to just go and find a different one of my videos that maybe doesn't involve children. This case was suggested by Shadow, so thank you for that. I appreciate any suggestions that you guys have. And if you have any more, then let me know. Just like to let you know, I mean, no disrespect to anyone I talk about today. I've just got this information from the internet to compile into a video for educational purposes. Peter Connolly was born on the 1st of March in 2006 in London in England. His mother was 25 year old Tracy Connolly and she met his father at the age of 16. He was actually 33 years old at the time so obviously he was quite a lot older than her. Peter's biological father could not be named for legal reasons so we don't know his name to this day. But anyway they got together, they moved in, they began their family, they had three daughters initially before they went on to have their son Peter. And then three months after they had Peter, they actually ended up splitting up. They were having a lot of arguments about housework and things like that. And apparently there was these allegations that Tracy was cheating on him as well. So they split up. Tracy moved out and moved with the kids to Harrogate in London. And very quickly she met a new man. She began her relationship with a new boyfriend, 33 year old Stephen Barker. They seemed to get on really well, you know, he would look after the kids a lot, he got on really well with them. Despite that, their father, their biological father, grew concerned. He was very loving towards his kids, he absolutely adored them and when he went to visit one time and he saw that the living conditions that they were living in, so the house was very dirty, it smelt like urine, it was very untidy, cramped, unhygienic, it was just not a place you want your kids to be raised in, like it was pretty dismal conditions so he decided to get in touch with social services and let them know about these conditions that his kids were living in and ask them to like keep an eye on it they went out and they said that everything seemed okay yes okay the conditions were dirty and it wasn't that great but she seemed to be trying her best there was no intentional neglect going on she suffered from depression and she was just trying the best that she could. Now, apparently as a child, she'd not been given a lot of things. And so as an adult, she didn't really know to give them to her children because she'd never got them. So she didn't really know how to look after them properly. And it was like a learning curve for her. And because of that, she began working closely with social services, you know, optionally to try and learn these things to care for her kids better. So she really was trying. At this time, Stephen hadn't actually moved in with her and the kids yet. So he was just round a lot and he would look after them, but he didn't actually live there permanently. And you know, him not being there. So when social services came around, all they saw was Tracy living there and they marked her as a functioning mother. The house was a mess, yes, but she was feeding them. She was dressing them, she was clothing them, she was taking care of them, doing the best that she could, giving them the necessities that they needed. And therefore that is why she was described as functional. The social services noted baby Peter as being this very lively, very friendly and very vocal little boy. Yes, okay, he couldn't speak yet, but that didn't stop him from trying. He was always coming out with these little sounds and he was just such a lovely little bubbly guy who wanted to find his voice. They watched his mother feed him, care for him, if, you know, he fell over and hurt himself, he would go running up to her. They noted a clear mother and son bond. He would be the one who she would go to. He, she would be the one that he would go to if he was, you know, feeling sad or something like that. So they had this really good bond together. Everything seemed normal with their relationship. Then in December 2006, Peter ends up going to hospital for this bad bump that was on his head. And whilst there, doctors noticed a lot more injuries. During the examination, the GP found bruises all over his chest and all over his face. So as a result of that, they called social services. They contacted Tracy and she told them that she was the only person that looked after him, her along with her mother Mary, 
and then they were both arrested and brought in for questioning. They weren't being charged with anything, it was just like a suspicious situation where they needed to bring them in and, you know, talk to them. What she said though wasn't actually true because Stephen had moved into the flat a couple of months ago, so he was now living with them, but she never mentioned his name. She never said that he looked after them at all, even though he was the primary one that would look after the kids. He would pretty much do everything for them, but she never once mentioned his name. And she also asked her mother, Mary, to not mention that Stephen was there looking after the kids either. Which Mary didn't think much of. I guess she thought it was weird, but that was her daughter and so she's asking her not to do it and so she did. She didn't tell them about Stephen either. Due to his injuries, Peter was put on the at-risk of abuse register. And as a result of that, social services involvement with the family increased. Peter was actually put into the care of a family friend and social services tried to get him adopted. They tried like a court case to put him up for adoption, which they eventually lost. And within five weeks, he was returned home into his mother's care and unbeknown to them, Stephen's care. And that was in January of 2007. That was around the time that they began to shut Mary out and they began to like shun her from the family. She really didn't approve of Stephen at all. She didn't approve of him as her daughter's boyfriend. And she certainly did not approve of him as a role model as a stepfather to her grandchildren. She didn't like him because he would get angry very quickly, he had a short fuse and a short temper, and he would just snap a lot of the time very quickly without even a warning. She even said that she watched him around the kids and when it came to Peter, Peter looked scared of him. On one occasion she recalled that Peter was over by the other end of the room I believe and Stephen came in one day and he saw him went kind of rushing over to his grandma as quick as he could, screamed for her to pick him up and then he hid behind her because he was frightened of Stephen. And Stephen was a very manipulative man and he began twisting Tracy into not wanting to see her mum because obviously Mary's noting this weird vibe that she's getting off Peter and Stephen together and so to quash that he's twisting Tracy into not wanting to see her so that she's not around as often and she doesn't notice anything off. He was a strange guy. He had a collection of Nazi memorabilia. He had this fascination with knives and he was also said to be this loner. Not only that, he suffered from depression, which could have been why he was angry a lot, like why he had quite, quite a short temper and a short fuse. Often people with depression can be very irritable and short tempered and then they can just snap. He also had learning difficulty too. So during this time, during all this is going on, a whistleblower sends a letter about her concerns of the failings in child protection in Haringey. That was sent in February of 2007 to the Department of Health. In March, inspectors meet up with them to kind of address their concerns. So you've got all of this going on with social services, people not really thinking that they're doing the job properly, and then you've got poor Peter, who is being seen by those social services, and I don't know, they're not, they're not really seeing it clearly. But again, in their defense, Tracy didn't tell them about Stephen. So, you know, they didn't know about him at all. Over the next two months of Peter going back to his mother, he would be hospitalized another two times for various different injuries. In April, baby Peter is admitted to hospital with bruises, two black eyes, swelling on the left side of his head, having previously been admitted, you know, with scratches all over his body, you know, scars, things like that, cuts. After his admission, they find this swelling on his head to be very suspicious, and so they contact social services yet again. She began to explain away it again, you know, they contact her, she says that, bearing in mind Peter is 15 months old or something at this point, yeah, so she says that he's getting into fights with other kids, and then they end up scratching and bruising each other and whatnot, which is just ridiculous. Who's ever heard of babies scrapping? I mean, come on. They didn't believe her, like they shouldn't have, seriously. In May of 2007, she was arrested again. She was never actually charged with anything though. So yeah, it's pretty pointless really. Less than a month passed by and the social worker comes for a visit. They notice a lot of new marks on Peter, new bruises, new scratches. And so they inform the police. Peter was taken in for another medical examination where they confirmed that the injuries were likely due to abuse. And yet again, they don't do anything. I don't get it. Why weren't they doing anything? Well, they were doing little bits, but then they just put him back into the care again. And I just don't understand why. You can clearly see that this little baby 
he's being abused and you just keep sending him back there and it's just it just kills you inside it really does on the 4th of June, Peter once again is taken into the care of a close friend for safeguarding. He was there only a couple of weeks and then he was given back to Tracy again. The reasoning behind this, you may ask, was that you know how the injuries were said that it was probably from abuse? Well, now they were probably accidental. Remember how they observed him as being this lively kid who was always running around and you know, all over the place? Well, they assumed that because of that, he fell over a lot. And then, of course, that was the cause of the injuries, not the abuse that he was being inflicted to. No, of course not. Around this time, social workers heard rumours of a man in Tracy's life, and so they confront her with it. They ask her if she has a boyfriend. She's been hiding him from them all this time, and they didn't have a clue, so they confront her, they ask her, her and she says, no, he's not my boyfriend, he's just a friend that comes round a lot, but he is not my boyfriend, and obviously he doesn't live here. And the social worker, really having no reason to doubt her on that, you know, it's only a rumour she's heard, she's never seen him around the house, she's never heard of this before now. She took her word at it, but of course, it was a lie not that she knew that at the time. That coupled with family members never even mentioning that she had a boyfriend or anything like that, you know, they were inclined to believe her. The reason she wanted to hide him was because he had a past. They would have done a background check on him and they would uncover his criminal record. And again, she was on chat rooms and things and he was looking after a kid. So maybe that's the reason that she didn't want them to know about him because then she wouldn't have somebody to watch the kids all the time. I don't know. So if they did look into him, they would find out that he was very well known with the RSPCA for torturing animals. He would torture little pets such as rabbits, guinea pigs, things like that, which we all know that that is not a good sign in the crime community. You guys all know that. It's not a good sign. Then in June of 2007, his brother, Jason, moved in with his 15-year-old girlfriend and they were trying to hide that from the police because, of course, it's illegal. So they were having an illegal relationship. They're trying to hide that from the police. So they hide out at their house. So if they start looking into all the background, they will also find his brother. And yeah, that they were also both to be known criminals too. When they were younger, they had imprisoned and tortured their own grandmother in an attempt for her to change her will so that they would get more money, which is horrendous. Why would you do that to your grandma? She luckily managed to press charges against them, everything was going through. Unfortunately, before the charges were brought forward, she passed away due to pneumonia and the charges were simply dropped. So if social services knew about these violent, horrible people that were in the same house caring for this little baby boy, maybe this case would have ended in such a different way. On the 30th of July, injuries were missed by a social worker on his hands and his face when he was deliberately smeared with chocolate to try and cover them up. Over the next few months, Peter was seen by countless GPs, social workers, pediatricians, hospitals, all of which noticed a decline in his physical health. His little bubbly and outgoing personality, his lively little boy, was just changing. He was becoming very shy, he was becoming very introverted and just very withdrawn and it was a complete turntable to the little boy that he normally was. He was also losing weight, he had loads of bruises, loads of scratches. All the people that saw him noticed these, they marked them down in his file so it's there in black and white, all official like, and nobody did anything about it. Nobody. I don't understand it. I just don't understand how you can see all these random injuries on a kid. I know some kids are like accident prone, but come on, he's losing weight. His personality has changed. Those are clear signs. I am not a social worker, but I know with vulnerable people and things like that, and you have to do lots of training on it. That is their job. That They notice stuff like that. They should notice things like that. They did notice it, but they just didn't do anything about it. Some did believe her stories that, you know, she he was fighting, blah, 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 whatever she said. But others did suspect abuse and yet they still didn't do anything about it. On the 1st of August, Peter was seen by Dr. Saba Al-Zayat at St. Anne's Hospital and that would be his last visit because just two days later, on the 2nd of August in 2007, emergency services were called to Tracy's home after she found Peter unresponsive in his car. When the paramedics got there, they found that he was in his cot wearing only a nappy, he was freezing cold and he was blue. They attempted resuscitation at the scene and in the ambulance on the way to the hospital. Unfortunately, none were successful and he was later pronounced dead at 12.20pm. So police arrest Tracy on suspicion of murder and guess what? She sings like a bird now because, oh yeah, now that she 
is, you know, there's murder on, on the files and, you know, she might get done for murder. Well, she tells them all about Steven, she tells them all about Jason, which she should have done a long bloody time ago. But this time, of course, it's really serious and she's gonna get all the blame for it if she doesn't, so she just spills the beans. So the police go to the flat and they go to arrest the others, but they weren't actually there at the time. They had fled, so they had fled to this campsite in Epping Forest somewhere. They were eventually caught though. The postmortem was done on little baby P and he he was found to have over 50 injuries. I'm just gonna read them off in a list because there's a lot of them. Yeah, they're, they're, it's awful. He had numerous cuts, scratches, bruises and scars. He was missing the tip of his right middle finger. He had gashes to the top of his head. Some were really severe and some actually looked like bite marks, which is just horrendous. I mean, it's just disgusting and awful what this poor little boy went through and how much he suffered at the hands of these monsters. He had large bru a large bruise covering the left temple area to his ear, skin missing from his tongue and lips with the skin between his upper lip and gum torn, bruises covering his whole face, skin missing from the bridge of his nose, bruises all over his chest and lower back, cuts on his neck and chin, all his fingernails and toenails were just black because they were just all bruised. And one of each, one of his toenails and one of his fingernails were missing, having been deliberately removed. His left ear was torn at the bottom and was coming away from his head as if it had been pulled. One of his front teeth was missing, which was later found in his stomach. And that made them believe that it had been knocked out with like such a force that it forced him to swallow it. He had a fractured tibia, seven rib fractures, along with his most severe injury, which was a broken spine. It's believed that that injury was caused by him lying flat and somebody pushing him down either over a knee with great force or over, you know, a cot side and just pushing him down and that is what caused the broken spine. They believe that that caused a lot of his blood vessels to burst and it caused a lot of internal bleeding. A lot of his wounds were really infected because, as I said, he, they were living in squalor in a sense, you know, the house was really dirty and they're not going to treat his wounds. They're literally inflicting them, so why the heck are they going to treat them? They're just going to leave them. So, as a result, lots of them were infected. Because of all the injuries, they couldn't actually determine what was his cause of death. It is thought that the force that was put into kind of him swallowing his tooth would have had to put that much force on his head that it probably caused internal bleeding at the top of his spine which then led to his heart stopping and a lot of these injuries had been there for weeks some of them even months so when he went to the doctors and that was two days before he died he would have had those fractured ribs and you want to know how we know that well because at the time of his death they had already began healing so he went to the doctors full of bruises, full of scars, full of scratches. He had fractured ribs, maybe not seven at the time, who knows? But he probably did. And she didn't, I don't know, she didn't notice any of them. She missed everything. Oh, but wait, she did note him as being a little bit cranky. But you know, she didn't bother to find out the reasoning behind that. You know, he's always oh, a little bit cranky, but that's it. Well, he's got seven broken ribs, so yeah. And numerous other injuries. Yeah, I think you'd be a little bit cranky too. Some even believed that maybe at the time that he went to the doctors, he possibly had the spa fractured spine too. Others do believe that it was more likely done when they got home later that night. In November of 2008, the trial began of Tracy Connolly, Stephen Barker and Jason Barker. Jason and Tracy were actually cleared of murder charges due to insufficient evidence. Stephen was put up for the murder charge but was found not guilty. I don't get why. He literally killed that little boy. His abuse ended up leading to that little boy's death and I don't know why he didn't get convicted for murder for that but he didn't and let me just say that that made me actually really angry it really really did if I've missed something and you guys know why he didn't get charged for murder let me know but in my eyes he killed that little boy so I don't get it but yeah all three were prosecuted for causing or allowing the death of a child or a vulnerable person. And Tracy Connolly pled guilty to that. The brothers, however, they pled not guilty. You know, they didn't do anything, but they were found to be guilty of that. In November of 2009, which was the year later, not related to 
you know, baby P's case at all, Stephen was found guilty of the rape of a two-year-old little girl. Now, I don't know who this two-year-old little girl was. Her name has always been kept out of the media. It's always been kept, you know, her anonymity has been kept due to obvious reasons. You know, you wouldn't want to, you wouldn't want that out there being known. So, we don't know her name, but we do know that it wasn't you know, one of baby P's siblings or anything like that. So I don't know where he knew this girl from, but he raped her. Tracy Connolly got five years plus for her part in, you know, baby P's death. And that means that after five years, they will do like an assessment. And if she is deemed to no longer be a threat to society, she will just be let out. And then obviously if she is deemed a threat, she will stay in for another period of time. And then I guess they'll do another assessment after that. Stephen Barker, was sentenced to life with a minimum of 22 years for his role in Baby P's case, along with the rape of that little girl. Jason Barker got much the same as Tracy. He got three years minimum plus. So again, he's going to be assessed. He was going to be assessed after three years to see whether he was a, a threat and then he would be released. In August of 2011, Jason Barker was released. He went on to change his name to Jason Owen and has since been in and out of prison over and over again for various different things. In 2013, Tracy Connolly was released from prison, but then two years go by and we get to 2015 and she was jailed again for breaching the terms of her release. She was denied parole in 2018 and I believe is still in prison now. In August of 2017, Stephen O applied for parole but he was denied and he still remains in prison. Most people believe that he won't be getting out anytime soon if ever and if he did that he would be quite an elderly man when he gets out and damn right what he did to that little boy is disgusting and he should never get out. When you look into this case and see how the officials handled it and the care that baby P should have gotten he should have been pulled out of there a long time ago and because he wasn't he ended up losing his life. Social services doctors, hospitals, police even, they all failed Peter. Their job was to help and protect vulnerable people and children and they just failed completely. Analysis and reports and things have been done over the years and it was said that if they had done their job properly, Peter would probably still be alive today. He would have been taken away from these monsters, he would have found a lovely new family and he'd be 15 years old now. This case brought a lot of, due to the circumstances, a lot of heartache and rage you know but not only that it's found out that peter actually died under the same social services that eight-year-old victoria columbia died under seven years before peter if any of you guys don't know that case it is another horrible case of child neglect and she was once more failed by those around her she was failed by everyone that was supposed to help her she was a lovely smiley little girl and I've done a full case on her, if you want to look at that, go check it out. But no matter how much abuse she endured, she always had a smile. And again, that one, if you do want to watch it, it's heartbreaking, it is so tragic. And as a result of her abuse, she ended up losing her life too. And that was under the same social services. They were both under the same social services, which, as you can imagine, when the public found out about that, they were absolutely furious, they were fuming. They demanded that people lose their jobs over it, which... I agree with because if you are not capable to do your job what you are trained to do and you do not do it and it ends up in a child losing its life then you should not be doing that job i'm sorry but you shouldn't the doctor that saw peter two days before his death the one that didn't notice all his bruises didn't notice his, his rib fractures his broken bones the cuts the scars no nothing no it's nothing apart from that he was a little bit cranky well she was sacked and rightly so at least in my opinion anyway she actually faced so much backlash from everyone that she ended up abandoning her husband and her children and moving back to her home country six other people were either sacked or resigned due to their part in peter's case one thing i didn't actually mention was the baby p thing so he was widely known as baby p during his trial and stuff because his name was never given out and so he was either referred to as baby p or child a until of course his identity did come out this case is widely known now it is out there if you've ever worked in any social services or literally anything with vulnerable people his case is made an example of to make people aware of the signs and things that other people missed and the things that you should be looking for with people that are being abused and kids that are being abused so his case is widely used in that now as like an example so baby p will never ever be forgotten his name will live on for a very long time and this case is just heartbreaking 
what that poor little boy had to endure. I just don't understand how evil and cruel you have to be to do things like that to an innocent little child. It's just beyond heartbreaking. And I just can't, I just can't understand it and I never ever will. But yeah, that is the end of this case. If you've enjoyed this video, give me a big thumbs up and subscribe to my channel for some more content. Anyway guys, that's all I have today on the case of Peter Connolly, little baby P. Thank you so much for watching and until next time, bye.